So welcome again to our third webinar, Exploring the Boundaries of Participatory and Communicative Democracy. Um, it's the third webinar in a series out of six. Um, and there's another one next week, and then we're going to take a break over summer and continue in September. Um, we decided to organize this webinar series um, to continue our exchanges and discussions um, that um, couldn't take place at the PSA um, for obvious reasons. And um, it would be better to see you all in one room, probably. Would be even better um, but this also allows us to continue exchanges with people who may or might not be able to attend conferences in person um, due to funding problems or something like that so it may be even more inclusive and this is also an upside to all of this um, today's webinar today's webinar um, is entitled exploring the boundaries of participatory and deliberative democracy exploring the communicative boundaries of participatory and deliberative democracy um, and the main aim of this webinar is to um, elaborate on theoretical and empirical perspectives and to explore how deliberative and participatory democracy rely on communication between different participants and different audiences and one main focus of the presentations that we're going to hear in a minute um, is the question, what are the positive or negative contributions of changing communication technologies to democracy? Today, we're going to hear three presentations. Unfortunately, um, Simon Niemeyer had to cancel yesterday. Um, he's sending his warm regards. Um, we're going to hear three presentations today, one by Stephen Coleman, the University of Leeds entitled Television Election Debates as Deliberative Spectacles. One from Marco Pino Rovira, Rovira from the University of Bristol, Why Digital Participatory Politics in Kambodja Under Threat and What This Means for Democracy. And one by James Wong from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Self Censorship and Deliberative Democracy. My suggestion is that we proceed in the order of the program. Um, here are all the presentations. Um, it's going to be 10 to 12 minutes, and I'm going to give you a brief heads up um, when, when time is running out. And afterwards, we're going to have room for discussion. Um, Hans will summarize some of the questions that may pop, pop up in the chat. So feel free to also put your questions to the presenters or your discussion points in the chat. Um, and afterwards, there will just be an open space um, where we can debate um, the topics addressed by the presenters. All right, I'm looking very much forward to your presentation. And um, now the first talk will be by Stephen Coleman, mm -hmm. Television Election Debates as Deliberative Spectacles. Um, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you. It might seem rather odd for me to wish to explore the potential of televised debates such as those that take place at election time between party leaders as contributions towards a more deliberative system of representative democracy. After all, televised debates are mass mediated spectacles which some would criticise as mere performative displays of rhetorical dexterity, while deliberative exercises tend to be characterized by their lofty normative standards. What possible relationship could there be between these two kinds of event? If we turn to the research, substantial studies now exist about televised debates and about the practice of deliberation, but hardly ever about the two together. The debates literature rarely touches on the question of preference transformation within political interaction, while the deliberation literature has traditionally paid scant attention to the question of how its method could be scaled up to the demands of spectacular mass mediation. Each literature acclaims its own form of discursive enactment while failing to acknowledge the other. 
But if, as many of us now argue, a deliberative system depends upon a balance of communicative ecologies in which different contexts facilitate different forms of public reflection and judgment, televised election debates might be regarded as being at the soft end of the deliberative spectrum, within the del deliberative spectrum, albeit on the boundary. While they might fail the rigorous tests of full-blown deliberation, they could be seen as providing catalysts for the kind of mass population level problem flaming, framing that can trigger forms of everyday political talk. From the very outset, televised election debates were celebrated by some scholars as mass democratic spectacles. After the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon debate, Theodore White observed that television had enabled, quote, the simultaneous gathering of all the tribes of America to ponder their choice between two chieftains in the largest political convocation in the history of man. Television was regarded as the best place available in modern society for shared cultural events to be witnessed and participated in by a mass audience. Diane and Katz famously pointed to the scope of election debates as media events to transfix a population, helping citizens to focus on shared relevance, feelings and history. And this resulted in their assuming iconic significance within mass mediated democracy. In reaching a larger audience than any other campaign event, attracting sections of the electorate who are least likely to follow other aspects of the campaign, and dramatizing political choice by embodying the available options in performances by protagonists whose values and behavior are open to live inspection, televised debates are uniquely transparent and inclusive events. Moreover, as spectacles, they generate excitement, a rare effect within the logos bound domain of rational policy choice. So while deliberative researchers have had little to say directly about televised debates, their general disdain for politics as show business was bound to distance them from the celebration of anything resembling a media spectacle. Proponents of deliberation argue that democracy requires quality as much, if not more than quantity. That whilst televised election debates reach the people, they invite them to arrive at superficial judgments on the basis of strategic rhetoric. Democratic quality calls for the provision of well-organized opportunities for the members of the public or mini publics serving as a political microcosm to reflect as critical rational equals on matters that affect them equally. Proponents of televised debates might respond to this by observing that deliberative exercises conducted within rarefied conditions of pristine experimentalism are all very well, but have nothing like the reach or effect of debates broadcast to a mass audience. This imagined dialogue could go on and on with each side berating the other for normative deficiencies that unfit them for democracy. But at stake here is something more than a disagreement about how best to perform political disagreement. These positions are rooted in a much broader debate about the nature of democratic culture. Proponents of deliberation tend to echo the kind of criticisms put by the Frankfurt School, for whom mass culture reduced human beings to atomized, consuming, spectating individuals, sucked into a vortex of inertia under the auspices of the culture industry. This is a bleak and sometimes even conspiratorial theory of mass cultural consumption. For if people can't see through the artifice of television production, how can they see through the stratagems and gambits of politicians? As Adorno and Rabin Bach suggested, people were not only falling for the swindle, but forcing their eyes shut and voicing approval in the presence of political mendacity. But not all scholars, however critical, shared the Frankfurt School's pessimism about television. 
Raymond Williams, as an astute cultural theorist of the new me medium, was troubled by this idea of the masses, declaring that there are in fact no masses, but only ways of seeing people as masses. The masses are always the others whom we don't know and can't know. And in empirical studies of television, we have increasingly come to recognize the active viewer, the viewer who is in fact not switching off their mind the moment they switch on their television, but engaged in something approaching deliberative thought as they weigh up what is being said to them. So drawing on Mansbridge and colleagues wise acknowledgement that quote, no single forum, however ideally constituted, could possess deliberative capacity sufficient to legitimate most of the decisions and policies that democracies adopt. Deliberative system theorists are more interested in the chain of macro social discourse rather than which people um, and uh, encounter which resources and opportunities. There are a range of resources and opportunities. Acknowledging the complexity of the democratic process, system theorists do not expect deliberation to take place in one temporally bound, specially designed context, but to unfold over time across a range of settings. So to conclude, my argument is that deliberative theorists need to give serious thought to how spectacular mass mediated events like televised election debates might fit within their proposed democratic system. As, as with so much other, um, so many other dilemmas facing deliberative theorists, this will entail coming to terms with the complex problem of political rhetoric. In the evaluation of the first ever UK televised election debates in 2010, which I led with my colleagues, I observed a split in media commentary between a focus upon substance of the rich arguments presented in the debates and an image of the debates as a rhetorical game in which players sought to outmaneuver one another. We showed that a mixture of both of these approaches was appropriate to engage democratic understanding. The former in order to acknowledge the serious policy choices facing the electorate, but the latter in order to recognize that the reach and intelligibility of a televised debate depends upon its dramatic force and capacity to hold the attention of a television audience. Condescension towards the skills of rhetorical performance would not serve democracy. So I want to suggest that the rhetorically adept politician is all too easily characterized as an embryonic populist, insidiously courting followers through the use of artful presentation and wily sophistry. But do we really expect democratic de deliberation to be devoid of effective persuasion? Uh, Simone Chambers has, of course, developed a sophisticated case for what she calls deliberative rhetoric, which, quote, creates a dynamic relationship between speaker and hearer with a view to making people see things in new ways and becoming more reflective. The challenge in this sense is not to expunge rhetorical performances from debates or deliberation in general, but to encourage mo modes of rhetorical address that inspire democratic reflection. Such outcomes... I'm, I'm, sorry, you've got two minutes left. I'm sorry, I have to be rigid on time. <laughs> that's fine, I have one, <laughs> one minute to fill. Such outcomes can only be assessed through reception studies designed to explore how viewers make sense of the messages addressed to them in televised debates. When research is conducted on how people interpret debates, it soon becomes clear that the effectiveness of rhetorical appeal is unevenly distributed according to people's capabilities. In Lloyd Bitzer's seminal article on the rhetorical situation, he states that rhetoric is a mode of altering reality, not by the direct application of energy to objects, but by the creation of discourse, which changes reality through the mediation of thought and action. 
So I want to propose that there is no necessary strain between the spectacle of te the televised event and the reflectiveness of the, de the deliberative process. The democratic objective should be to create both while ensuring that the normative value of each is nurtured. This involves much more inventive and imaginative thought as to how that can be accomplished. But deliberative theorists will not be able to contribute to that conversation if they dismiss mass mediated spectacles as the usurpation of democracy by theatricality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I'm, I was always sorry that I had to ask you to be, be brief because it was such an inspiring talk and conversation to have. Um, but we also need time for the other speakers. Um, and um, the next one in line is Mark. Um, yes. Uh, well, so I'm not going to say any more. It's your turn. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning and thank you for the presentation uh, before and thank you also for organizing these wonderful series of um, seminars. Uh, as I only have 10 to 12 minutes, I'll try to, to go straight to the point. And I wanted to emphasize, first of all, that 99% uh, of the data and information that I will share with you today actually comes from my doctoral thesis that I'm currently writing at the moment. So obviously I don't have the time to to go through most of the details, but if you do have questions about it, I'll be more than happy to, to answer the questions um, during the, the Q&A. Um, so I wanted to share um, my slides with you, if this works. Okay. Right, so what I wanted to do today is to explore some of the boundaries, three in particular, of um, participation and deliberation in, in democracy. And I will do that uh, using very specific means, uh, such as digital tools and digital media. And I will use a very specific case study um, that is Cambodia, an example of hybrid democracy. So in this presentation, I want to cover uh, three different areas. First of all, I will contextualize a little bit Cambodia, since I acknowledge that most of you might not be familiar with the country. And I will argue that uh, political participation in Cambodia is of low quality. Then I will assess the impact of digital media in political participation. And finally, I will just try to answer the big question on whether or not digital media can actually push the boundaries of political participation. Uh, so Cambodia, uh, it is an example of hybridity, a hybrid regime that mixes democratic mechanisms with authoritarian practices. But I think that Cambodia is better described as, as a neo-authoritarian um, state. According to the constitution, Cambodia is a liberal democracy, but most of the practices by the government are rather uh, authoritarian. So again, I think that neo-authoritarianism is a lot is a better term to, to describe Cambodia. Looking at participation, there is a very interesting paradox, and it doesn't only apply to Cambodia, it applies, broadly speaking, to Southeast Asia. And it is that in terms of electoral democracy, Cambodia is actually doing really well. If we look at uh, voters' turnout for the last 20 years, uh, participation is as high as uh, 75, 80, 85, even 90%. So in quantitative terms, um, political participation in Cambodia is, is absolutely great. On the other hand, uh, liberal constitutionalism, so all of the freedoms and liberties that citizens uh, should enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis are rather limited. So the, the channels for uh, political contestation are rather limited. So in qualitative terms, then political participation is is actually really weak. We can see that very easily by looking at the civil society. Over the last uh, three, four, five years, the government has been putting a lot of pressure on the freedoms of the civil society. It has, um, it has fragmented the civil society. It has also isolated most of its members. And this has triggered a, fear, a feeling of uh, political fear. Um, citizens don't want to talk openly um, about their political preferences and there has also been an erosion 
of, of trust within the civil society and also from the civil society to the state, to the government. Uh, so basically this is why I ask, these are some of the reasons that I'm using to argue that political participation, at least in qualitative terms, it is of very low quality. There are a lot of consequences associated to, to, to this, um, but I would like to stress self-censorship. And it is nowadays very rare to, to walk through the streets of Phnom Penh, the capital city, and getting into a coffee shop, and, and you cannot listen to people discussing political issues. It is extremely frustrating uh, not being able to discuss the local politics with uh, Cambodian citizens because they are really afraid of uh, voicing their political views just in case someone might be uh, listening and they could be reported to the government because they, let's say, they support an opposition party. So this has also triggered a culture of uh, political silence. These are two very short uh, quotes from one of the respondents that I met last year, um, a young citizen from Phnom Penh in his early 30s. He said, we only have one opportunity, and it is every five years. This is it. Obviously, he was talking about elections. Um, and I think that this quote is, is really short, but it exemplifies very well that participation actually means voting once every five years, at least to most of my uh, respondents. They do not really uh, take into consideration these day-to-day -day actions uh, of deliberation, for example, uh, that also account for political participation. And then he also adds, if you ignore anything that can be seen as political, then you can live peacefully. I'm not rich, but I live decently thanks to my job. This is enough only if you ignore politics. So I think that this short quote exemplifies perfectly the culture of fear and uh, political uh, silence that most of my respondents uh, showed during the interview. So this is boundary number one, low quality participation. But things changed in the early 2010s with the arrival of uh, digital tools and digital media, uh, more in particular smartphones and Facebook in the case of Cambodia. Because these digital tools and means were a gateway for political um, engagement, for more active political engagement, uh, even for the first time in the case of, of many respondents. Um, so there were lots of benefits associated to the use of digital uh, tools in politics, such as uh, better access to, to information, permanent access to independent media outlets, better communication, and the civil society got a new tool to, uh, to organize political movements uh, and different associations. But there was another change that it wasn't so obvious at first. And this is something I noticed um, after I did some interviews and digital tools actually broke the climate of political fear to a certain extent. There was a sense of openness and all of a sudden people or uh, most of my respondents were willing to discuss political issues publicly, um, even with me, with a stranger that they didn't know at all. So this was one of the um, biggest um, opportunities of, of digital tools in politics. However, on the flip side, there were two big challenges. Uh, the first one is that uh, the government obviously learned of the potential of digital tools in politics. So they also started to use digital media for their own purposes and they cracked down on the civil society. So all of a sudden, uh, the tools that were in the hands of random citizens were also in the hands of an autocratic um, government in this case. So th there was a group of scholars that 15, 20 years ago uh, said that digital tools were the liberation tools, that they were the ultimate tools that uh, many societies needed to become uh, free and to, and to become a liberal democracy. But I think that experience has also taught us that uh, digital tools are also tools for repression. Um, and the second challenge is the digital divide. So the use of digital tools in politics reinforced uh, many social markers that um, can help us to understand how citizens are using digital tools in politics and who is getting the most out of them. In the case of Cambodia, for example, age is an extremely important marker for a very simple reason. 
age helps us to determine who is more likely to have gone through civil war, genocide, or at least uh, the post-war era. So those who are older are more likely to be a threat of engaging in political actions, but those who are younger um, are less a threat, uh, or they are a threat in a different way to engage into politics. Um, age is also important to determine education. Uh, younger citizens are simply almost digital natives, so they are a lot more likely to use digital tools efficiently uh, and effectively to engage into politics. And young citizens are also a lot more likely to move from the rural areas to the city, so to move from a small village in the countryside that has usually um, a conservative mindset to uh, the big city where you find the most liberal ideas. So these are boundaries two and three. Uh, digital media that also fall in the hands of autocratic regimes or even liberal democratic regimes. We have seen that uh, with Trump and Twitter and we are seeing uh, this today with TikTok, for example. And the third boundary is digital divide in terms of access, age, education, and the division between urban and rural citizens. So the last, uh, the last Sorry, part. Two minutes left. Yeah, this is the last slide. So uh, the question is whether or not digital media can push the boundaries for political participation. I would say yes, but it's more a yes, but. Um, I think that digital tools are very useful, but we should focus on enhancing the quality of political participation. It's not just about the quantity, it's not just about giving smartphones, giving Facebook, giving Twitter, so people somehow can vote um, in the elections. It's about giving them the tools to, to make um, a rational choice on, 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 their, on their final decision when they go voting. Um, we also have to consider that digital media are also in the hands of governments and they usually have a different purpose uh, if we compare it to the civil society. And finally, uh, we have the issue of the digital divide. This is, um, this is very specific to each case study, but um, again, it is an important factor to take into consideration if we want to improve the quality of participation. So finally, uh, the debate between proponents and skeptics of digital politics. If I had to position myself, I, I would position myself as a skeptic, not because I think that they are not useful, but the narrative of the skeptics is um, a lot more comprehensive. They do acknowledge all the benefits, but they also acknowledge that there are lots of challenges. And unless we uh, tackle these challenges, it will be really difficult to make the most of um, digital politics. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it was really interesting, exciting. I learned a lot of new things. Um, <laughs> we're just going to hand over to James right now and mm -hmm. then get into the discussion later. Okay, right. Uh, thank you, Danica. So let me share some slides. Um, okay, so thanks very much, uh, everyone, and good morning. So I think my paper, there are some resemblances with uh, Mark's talk. I'm glad Mark talked about uh, self-censorship. Now, this is an issue that I'm really interested in, uh, partly because of uh, the situation in Hong Kong. Uh, we are experiencing the, uh, the, 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 the resurgence of authoritarian regime in Hong Kong. So my paper is a theory paper. And for some reason, I have been spending uh, a considerable amount of time on this paper, but I still think that it is in a preliminary shape. So I welcome uh, any comments and suggestions for polishing this paper. So uh, let me just get started. Now, why am I interested in self-censorship and deliberative democracy? Um, so one of the goals of deliberation is emancipation from oppressive forces and dominations. So contestation and authenticity are critical requirements for realizing these emancipatory goals in deliberation. And self-censorship entails the unwillingness to contest power and be authentic in communications. So it is antithetical to the, to the emancipatory goal of deliberation. So I was wondering if granting a voice to people is one of the central promises of deliberative democracy, it would be odd for deliberative Democrats uh, not to pay attention to the empirical phenomenon of self-censorship. So my uh, question, probably the questions for this paper, uh, 
is to what extent should deliberative democracy accept uh, self-censorship? So some background. Now this question has actually been partially answered before. So Matthew Fattenstein uh, in 2015 answered a similar question regarding self-censorship and democracy more generally, but he didn't focus on deliberative democracy in specific. His paper argues that self-censorship is an ordinary vice of democratic societies and some forms of self-censorship should be tolerated Nevertheless, it remains unclear to us as to what forms of self-censorship are tolerable. More importantly, Fattenstein's conception of self-censorship seems to be a little bit too narrow, which captures only some instances of self-censorship, uh, mainly political self-censorship, but not other types of self-censorship. So the, uh, there are two aims for my paper. So the first aim is to develop a wider conception of self-censorship to capture instances not only in the presence, but, on, but also in the absence of a public censor. The second aim is to suggest a non-consequentialist condition for judging between acceptable and unacceptable forms of self-censorship in a deliberative system. So what is self-censorship? Philip Cook and Conrad Heilman distinguished between two types of self-censorship in one of their papers in 2013. So that is private and public self-censorship. Public self-censorship takes place in the presence of a public censor. So I quote, individuals internalize some aspects of the public censor and then censor themselves, end of quote. For example, citizens refrain from criticizing the government in face of the new national security law in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, by contrast, private self-censorship does not require any public censor. I quote, the suppression, the suppression of an agent of his or her own attitudes where a public censor is either absent or irrelevant, end of quote. There are two possibilities or complications. So the four, first possibility is one censors himself by adopting a will external to his own perspective. For instance, immigrants refrain from criticizing the government up on reflection on their inferior status in and ignorance about the host country compared with the natives. Now this is private self-censorship by proxy according to Cook and Heilman. The second possibility is follows, as follows. One censors himself by developing a personal code of action. For example, a native reframes from making racist comments based on personal values and decency. This is self-censorship by self-constraint. Fackenstein argues, however, that such public-private distinction is unhelpful in defining what self-censorship is. Instead, he draws our attention to the sources of self-censorship, that is the arbitrary power relations existing between the censor and the censee. For example, citizens refrain from criticizing the government even in face of a benevolent dictator. That's it. Those citizens are subject to arbitrary power by the benevolent dictator. While Fettenstein's perspective of power relations is productive, the focus on arbitrary power only can only capture instances of political self-censorship where a public censor is usually present. This conception misses, however, the possibility that the censor and censee can be the same person. As pointed out by Cook and Heilman and illustrated by the immigrant example above. So identity power and self-censorship. Miranda Fricker in uh, one of her books uh, in 2007 about epistemic injustice suggests the concept of identity power to understand the complicated relationship between the interlo interlocutors. Identity power is an integral part of discursive exchange. It is in operation when interlocutors uh, possess shared imaginative conceptions of social identity, such as what it is or means to be a man or a woman, upper or lower class, a native or an immigrant, etc. Identity power is exercised when, for example, a native makes use of, often unintentionally, his identity as a native to influence the action of an immigrant such that the immigrant conceals uh, their political views. Notice that the native might not need to do anything at all to make the immigrant conceal political views. He or she might already be made to conceal political views by merely, uh, by merely his or her identity as an immigrant. 
So the tendency for immigrants to consume political wheels can arise from the stereotype that they are too ignorant for, for the politics in the host country. Such stereotypes serve as a basis for the imagined social identity, as in Fricke's terms. The conception of identity power can capture instances of private self-censorship. For instance, an immigrant chooses to silence himself from political discussions even without the presence of a public censor. He, he might just think that people like us are too ignorant to discuss politics of this place. Now for this case, this is self-censorship by proxy according to uh, Cook and Howland. On the other hand, a native chooses to keep the racist comments to himself as he realizes their potential harm on others, even without, similarly, the presence of any public censor. And this case, for this case, this is the self-censorship by self-constraint, according to Kofi and Howland. So Fricke's notion of identity power is helpful for expanding, in terms of power relations, the conception of self-censorship to covering instances without uh, those instances without public censors. So as you can see from this taxonomy. So because of the interest of time, I, I, I just uh, probably I'll just go, just go on to the next section. So the last section, basically. So back to our question. Should deliberative democracy accept self-censorship? And if so, what can that acceptable self-censorship? The systemic will of deliberative democracy is likely to offer a consequentialist response to this question. According to such will, non-deliberative speech acts and practices can have positive consequences for the deliberative qualities of the entire system. Self-censorship as a speech act failing to exhibit authenticity might be considered non-deliberative. Nevertheless, insofar as self-censorship can enhance the overall quality of the deliberative system, it might still be a justifiable means to the deliberative ends. Now, one possible scenario for this is suggested by Fackenstein before. Some relatively powerless and disadvantaged citizens might be excluded from effective deliberation due to bullying or humiliation. If a person, such as a native key opinion leader, silences himself from making racist comments, such that the atmosphere of the public sphere becomes more inclusive for people, including those powerless and disadvantaged to speak. Such self-censorship by self-constraint can be justifiable from the systemic perspective. Now, on the other hand, for self-censorship by proxy, the above consequentialist condition lacks something to be desired. This is because such condition fails to consider the possible wrong that is done on the sensee in the exercise of identity power. Even if a public censor is absent, the stereotypes existing in the imagined social identity may well be prejudicial. For example, the stereotypes like, all immigrants are too ignorant to discuss our politics. As pointed out by Fricke, identity power is an integral part of discursive exchange and prejudiced social stereotypes can wrongfully undermine the speaker capacity as a knower and hence prejudicially preempting the words of the speaker. In other words, when someone silences himself due to the prejudiced stereotypes, he is wronged, and this would constitute an instance of preemptive epistemic injustice, according to Fricke. So towards a non-consequentialist condition, as one of the ethical goals of deliberative systems is to promote mutual respect among citizens, there is little reason for deliberative democracy to tolerate the epistemic wrong done in self-censorship by proxy in particular, because it undermines the moral status of the sensei. This is so regardless of whether such non-deliberative speech acts can eventually lead to improvements in the overall quality of the deliberative system. One possibility of a non-consequentialist condition for judging between acceptable and unacceptable self-censorship can be whether it is traceable to any epistemic wrongs or injustice in which prejudiced social stereotypes are the source of preemptive silencing. Okay, conclusion. Two minutes. Perfect, two minutes, conclusion. Now to judge between acceptable and unacceptable self-censorship, we must be clear about how power is operated in the relationships between the censor and the sensee. Fricke's notion of identity power enables us to expand the conception of self-censorship to covering those instances without public censors. 
th this is especially relevant to the systemic will of deliberative democracy, which recognizes the role of everyday talks and communications in both the public and private spheres, rather than just the empowered space. So if identity power is exercised in a way that involves prejudiced stereotypes, such as in self-censorship by proxy, there is a non-consequential ground for deliberative democracy to reject it, regardless of whether such non-deliberative actions produce improved quality of the deliberative system. Uh, that's, that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, James. It was really thank you very much. inspiring to hear you talk about political theory again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so now we've heard three really interesting presentations. Um, I think the first two presentations ex also explored the ambivalent nature of new or not so new communication technologies, so of digital media and um, televised debates. And then James discussed a specific feature that is often not addressed in deliberative theories, so self-censorship in deliberation in communicative practices. And I would now hand over to Hans, who will pick out some questions from the chat, so questions that came up during the presentations. Then you will get the opportunity to answer them, so the speakers, and afterwards we will open the floor for discussion. Okay, um, so uh, there were a couple of questions to all of the speakers, although we're still waiting uh, for a question for James, which will probably still pop up. Um, so I'd like to ask the first question to, um, to Stephen, um, and this is about the inclusiveness of deliberation through debates, through TV debate, debates. The question is, all the candidates do not get invited into, into televised debates. The invitation is at the discretion of the organizers. This prevents the voice of some candidates to reach the public. Um, does this um, does it not create inf an information divide? So the question of um, the choice the organizers in putting together a, a TV debate make in who is invited and who is not invited. Stephen, do you have any thoughts on that? I think you need to unmute yourself. Indeed. I think it's important to make a distinction here between form and format. What do I mean by that? A televised debate is a particular form in which a kind of public discussion can take place. We have had a range of formats, some better than others, perhaps none of them meeting the standards that some of you would like to see, but they could. So the question, I think, is to start by saying, if televised debates perform a certain kind of function within the deliberative ecology, what kind of format for those televised debates would be best? And that would involve questions about who you include the speakers, how questions are raised, how moderators are or are not entitled to hold people speaking accountable for things that they say. There are a range of ways of doing this, and I've been involved in the discussion of a number of those ranges of ways over the last 20 years or so in, uh, with a number of broadcasters and a number of politicians. And the starting point has got to be, is it worth arguing about any of this from a deliberative point of view? Now, if it isn't, then I still think it's worth arguing about, but this particular discussion can be closed down. We don't need to discuss it. If it is worth getting a more deliberative form of televised debate, then what would the principles of that more deliberative format look like? And how can we try to bring them about? And that becomes a, a practical political question. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So I'll move on to a question to Mark. Um, the question is, um, sorry, I'm just looking through my notes here. Here it is. Um, do you have any earlier ideas about how to curb access and affordability issues in digital participation in Cambodia that could be applied more generally to Southeast Asia at the moment? 
Uh, well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so short answer is at the moment I, I don't, uh, especially because my research is focused on Cambodia in particular. And I think that making a generalization to Southeast Asia, um, it's, I mean, um, that, that's a broad question. Um, but affordability, it's something that, at, at least in the case of Cambodia, is not a big issue. Because if you look at, Cambodia has roughly 15 million inhabitants. Um, and if you look at the, at the number of adults in Cambodia and the number of uh, mobile phones, um, it is way, way above the number of, of citizens. I mean, most of the citizens have actually not one smartphone, but two or, or three. So it's not a matter of um, affordability, but it's more a matter of um, how, how citizens actually use um, their smartphones and their data plan on, on their smartphones. So I, I don't think that the number of, of smartphones or internet connection is actually indicative of the quality of political participation. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, now to the last question to James, and I also wanted to say that for everyone whose question I didn't get to read now, um, please do uh, contribute your question to the debate, which will just follow. We're just picking a couple, but we'd like obviously to hear from all of you. So the question to James, I was wondering if self-censorship is always problematic. It seems to me that all people self-censor themselves to some extent. Maybe then it is um, a sort of default position of participating in wider pol politics. And the question is about when self-censorship is bad. James, do you have any thoughts? Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Marta, for your question. I do agree that self-censorship self is not always bad. So that's why uh, I'm asking the question, uh, when is self-censorship acceptable, when it is not? So obviously, um, uh, I agree with you. To some extent, we do self-censor ourselves uh, for the sake of uh, personal decency, okay, or our code of conduct, for example. Or another example would be given by the by by uh, Fettenstein that um, so even a very opinionated uh, person uh, can actually keep the words okay maybe the racist comments or potentially offensive comments to himself or herself so as to enhance the quality of deliberation in the public sphere okay so so the so the bottom line is there can be positive consequences of self censorship. Now my, uh, my concern in this paper is whether, whether using the consequentialist uh, standard to judge between acceptable and unacceptable self-censorship is enough. Because by using the consequentialist standard, we might, uh, we might ignore or we might have ignored some uh, types of self-censorship that can generate positive consequences, but actually, on the other hand, it it will create uh, harms or wrongs on uh, the speakers or the internal kitters. Okay. So uh, um, my, uh, my response is basically, uh, no, not all self-censorship are bad or instances of self-censorship are bad. Uh, and uh, and uh, whether this is a kind of a default position of participation in wider politics. And I do agree with you, okay, it is when self-censorship self is bad. And that is actually uh, what I'm trying to answer in this paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. All right, so Thank for the final much. discussion, for the final discussion, I hand back over to Danica. Yeah, so you're welcome to raise your hands now when you want to ask a question. I can see you here in the participants list. Maybe also when you felt like your question um, wasn't addressed so far that you could not said or something else came up in the meantime. Hi. Hi. Um, please ask it. <laughs> Hi, James. So can I ask a question? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a question for James. Pretty interesting presentation. Um, but I can't type quickly enough to type a question in the in the chat bar. So I usually think of self-censorship as involving like a gap between what you privately think and what you publicly say. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of thing that Timur Kuran calls preference falsification and so on. And Cass Sunstein, so a kind of deliberative view of preference falsification is that 
this can be a good thing. Like it's a good thing if you privately believe in racial hierarchy, but you feel some public pressure to hypocritically mm -hmm. speak publicly in support of, of racial equality. Mm -hmm. But the point is there's always this gap, right? And that mm -hmm. self-censorship involves an awareness mm -hmm. of a gap between mm -hmm. what you privately believe and what you feel for whatever reason you can publicly announce. Mm -hmm. So I take it that you point to some really interesting sorts of cases of people mm -hmm. choosing to withhold or choosing to not speak, mm -hmm. right? And maybe mm -hmm. because they don't believe they have anything worth saying mm -hmm. or this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's linked to the kind of epistemic injustice. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how far we, I think they're really interesting cases, but my question is whether a case where somebody chooses not to speak because they don't think they've got anything worth contributing and that that feeling is itself you think due to some internalized prejudice of some sort social prejudice is that really self-censorship where there isn't you know where they're not saying one thing and thinking another or at least yeah i, I i'm interested in sort of how how it's different to do they need to perceive a gap between what they think and what they say in order for it to be self-censorship? Or can you be unwittingly self-censoring, I guess is my question. Can you be self-censoring without really knowing it? Um, James? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that wasn't right, very right. clear. Um, maybe, so if you don't want to um, answer... Yeah, maybe you can actually take more questions first. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> so time. I'm going to take more questions first. I have. Um, one question um, by Mark. Mark? Mm. Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to make a comment uh, following up on what Alfred said and also direct to James because I think that, that, that is very interesting. Um, during my research and more specifically during the field work, I identified basically four different forms of self-censorship. Mm -hmm. One was silence. People chose not to voice their, their political views. But then they also identified uh, some participants who chose not to express their views because they think that their views do not matter at all. Mm -hmm. and it is interesting to know that those respondents are usually the better educated ones. Mm -hmm. And then I also identified some respondents who chose to change their political narrative. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, that they are talking to someone and they know that the father of this person is a police officer, then they will automatically change their narrative to support the government. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, I identified some respondents that did something that, that I have named speaking only in favor or good of the government. So they mm -hmm. chose to ignore the negative comments on the government mm -hmm. and they only voiced the, like, mm -hmm. the positive comments. So, so my question would be, uh, for James especially, does self-censorship always, and I stress always, um, legitimate oppressive governments? James, shall we just collect so questions? Is self-censorship always legitimate for progressive governments? Or... So, sorry, can um, I... No, uh, no I, I, in this case, I said oppressive governments, especially oppressive. because it, 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 it's in the... Mm -hmm. It's in the political atmosphere that I was right, uh, right. working on, but I guess it can also be in, in less oppressive okay. Um, okay. atmospheres as well. I see. Uh, so, uh, in response to uh, Alfred's question, this is a very good question, a very tough one. Uh, so, you are asking, to my understanding, you're asking whether uh, if someone is self-censoring self them uh, himself or herself, uh, if he or she has already internalized the uh, the, the 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 wills, okay, from from the culture, from the norms, is there still a gap between what the person is thinking and also the person 
uh, what the person wants to say. I suppose you, 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 you might want to ask a question on this, whether the gaps is, still exist. Uh, actually, it's very, I don't know, I'm not an empiricist. I, <laughs> I don't know how to actually do a research to, to uncover, actually to, to reveal whether there is a gap between uh, what that person is thinking and what that person actually wants to say. But I suppose uh, there is a chance uh, we can imagine a situation, that situation exists. Um, the person uh, might be thinking according to the, what the norms or the culture supposes uh, him or her to, to think. So that is one thing. But if we go on to, to talk to that person uh, for some time, uh, presumably I think some deliberate Democrats might want to do that. So emancipate these people by sitting down and talking to these people so that they are able to realize more perspectives, uh, they are able to actually think uh, based on rationality rather than being constrained by their by their uh, the, by the stereotypes uh, identities. So I, I guess maybe after the deliberation, uh, we might be able to find this gap out. But I honestly, I really don't know uh, whether the empirical research can can work here. But we can imagine there is a possibility like this. Um, so what? What, what, what a person is thinking uh, may not seem to have any gap uh, with what he wants to say in the first instance, but as after deliberation, uh, I think there might be some other uh, uh, scenarios that actually comes up or possibilities that actually comes up. And I think this is also, uh, might be also one of the proposals by deliberative Democrats, how we can resolve the, or actually alleviate the problem of self-censorship. It is not, uh, to leave it as it is, but to locate or identify the sources of uh, the stereotype and the uh, poss possible uh, uh, victims okay, uh, under this uh, identity power and try to engage them and deliberate. Uh, I'm not sure whether I answered the question, but uh, 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 this is my instant yeah. reaction. And the other question yeah. uh, by Mark, so is self-censorship always uh, uh, present in the uh, oppressive government? Well, I think, um, I think yes, uh, particularly uh, for the self-censorship, sorry. We're running a bit out of time and we also probably oh, sorry. have questions to the sorry. other Maybe speakers. Maybe I just stop here for a while. Um, yeah, yeah or okay. one sentence or so. Okay, so. Uh, my answer is yes, I think so. Uh, uh, it also depends on what sort of censorship you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, that the, the, the scenarios with the existence of a public sense, uh, probably this is, uh, this is the case, I would say yes. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, and sorry to, that I have to cut you short, but we have no more problem. questions um, coming up now. So for everybody who, who didn't know that and misunderstood what I said, uh, or what I meant when I said, you can raise your hands, there's a hand raising function on Zoom. Um, so then I can see you here in the list of participants. Um, it's on the, on the right below the list of participants when you click that. We now have a question by Nicole Curato. Yes, um, actually my question builds on what Mark said. Um, I guess I'll just flip my question to you, Mark, and um, flip the question you asked to James, which is this opening up spaces, participatory spaces, um, legitimize oppressive government. So obviously there's now a language around sophisticated authoritarianism, new despotism, where there is some opening up of digital spaces for political participation, but this is also used as a listening device of authoritarian government. So I wonder what your take is on that um, development in the literature. Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree. And it, it's true that digital tools, digital media have opened up the um, the political space, it, it, it's a new opportunity for most of the actors in, in the civil society to, to have better uh, deliberation. But it is also true, as I said in the presentation, that these tools are nowadays being used to monitor what civil society is saying on Facebook or, um, or on other digital platforms. And there are several examples. And now I'm, I'm referring specifically to Cambodia, even though it also happens in other Southeast Asian countries um, where citizens um, have been arrested for comments that they have done on Facebook regarding the government, regarding the monarchy, and maybe comments that they did 
uh, months or even uh, years ago. Uh, so what this is doing is is making people um, uh, have self censorship and avoiding these digital platforms to um, to to practice uh, political deliberation. Okay, great, thanks. So we now have a question by Anastasia. Yes, thank you, Danica. So I would like to thank all presenters for their very interesting and thought-provoking papers. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Stephen for he, the televised uh, debates. And, and I think your approach is um, it's very interesting how we can actually engage deliberative uh, democracy with, uh, especially in the context of deliberative systems, uh, with uh, political communication studies and televised debates. Uh, and I very much understand that distinction you have made between uh, the form and the format, so the, all these kind of different things. Uh, there were different, as you say, formats, so, but in most of the cases um, you have monologues in televised debates that are very well structured, that are very well, uh, you know, moderated by the people that are there, but the, usually they don't <coughs> actually trigger any interaction, although there were some formats that were actually engaging with the audience as well, uh, especially the Eurovision debate for European Parliament elections, but that, then it was very difficult to manage this kind of input from thousands of people. So I was just wondering whether you, ha you have in your mind a specific format or where we should direct this actually very productive discussion around this um, expansion of deliberative processes in other devices and perhaps the possibility of uh, increasing the knowledge of the of the people around this kind of uh, deliberative spaces that sometimes it seems that they're not really very well informed. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that it is a productive discussion because that's all that I really wanted to establish uh, thus far. I wanted to simply um, spend a certain amount of time demonstrating that what I was saying was not completely crazy. So if I've established that, that's good. The, the next part is what kind of things might one do? And I think it is, um, for example, in 1992 in the US debates, they had town meetings. And in some of those town meetings debates, significant discussion took place between audiences and presidential candidates that cause those presidential candidates to have to stop and think before they answered, which caused them to have to interact. So I've been working on a number of possible elements of the format, and incidentally it's informed by qualitative research that I've been doing with debate audiences. And one of the elements that I think is most promising is what I would call surprise. When you talk to most audiences for televised debates, they say, look, the politicians know what's going to happen. It's all scripted. It's all prepared. Why don't we ever surprise them in some way? So, for example, one of the ideas that I've been thinking about is the idea of people being encouraged for a week before a debate to make videos that explain a particular problem in their life and a particular challenge that they think they're facing these are put on without any um, preparation by the politician and the politicians who want to lead the country have to respond to those dilemmas that people are facing now that's that's just one example i'm not saying it's the panacea but i think it's a kind of format i think that there are a number of things that can be done using digital media um, a lot of people we know now are watching these debates and using another screen at the same time. Can we merge those screens? Can we bring in forms of uh, public accountability that is more spontaneous than the polls that take place after? And I should also very briefly talk about a piece of technological work that I'd need a lot longer to talk to you about, which is real-time observation of how people are making sense of the messages during televised debates. So working with technologists, we've created a new tool that allows us to observe 
what people are thinking according to a series of statements that connect with their capabilities as democratic citizens. And you can read papers that I've published about that in the International Journal of Press Politics and the International Journal of Communication. So there are a number of ways. I think the important point is that deliberative theorists have to throw their lot in. They have to be prepared to, in a sense, um, climb into the rather muddy territory of high level political party and broadcaster negotiations, which are never going to be according to the loftiest principles. But you can push those principles up normatively by deciding to enter into them and becoming a voice. Hey, great, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm using my host, or not host, but chair privilege now to also put a brief question to you, Stephen, that picks up on the previous one, I think. Um, I really loved your assessment of um, yeah, the, the democratic functions also the televised debates can, can play um, within political systems, um, particularly because I don't like this rather elitist evaluation of the early Frankfurt School of the culture industry and so on. Um, however, I was wondering, um, one, one important thing is that viewers of televised debates, citizens, can actually make sense in the, the end of, of those debates and that they can yeah, interpret them and make sense of them. It's also something you just pointed out. Um, so one point would be discussing the formats and another point would be um, how can we actually promote those citizen capacities or capabilities that are required to make sense of these debates and that I think not only is something that has to be dealt with within um, these formats or whatever digital and, and televised combination that may be, but also within the broader system when you take on the systemic perspective. Yeah. How yeah. that comes into play. Yeah, I mean, I think empirically there's work to be done around formats theoretically there's a lot of work to be done in reception studies around capabilities and i think uses and gratification theory which was a very valuable theory went so far but it was faced with the problem of adaptive preferences that very often people will uh, will be satisfied with certain forms of provision because they're not questioning what they need to do to flourish as democratic citizens so the perspective that i've been taking is precisely the one that you have um, um, suggested we should take uh, it, it is not to ask what 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 citizens need um, in the sense of some kind of civics lesson, but it's to ask what citizens themselves um, determine is part of their own um, deficiency, their deficit in terms of access to information, being victims of vulnerable to manipulation, uh, feeling that things might not make a difference to them. And as soon as we start to capture those differentiated responses, the democratic picture of what's going on in those debates becomes much more complex and also much more democratically significant. So I, I, I agree with where your question is coming from. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now we have one um, last question. Um, one hand, hand raised. Um, Al Boss, I'm not sure if I know you, so I cannot pronounce the correct name, but it's, it's your turn now. And everybody who wants to ask a question now, it's the last chance, I think. Um, before we close the um hi yeah i'm calling in from america um so i was curious on kind of the relationship between all of your talks um and how you see that as um i i posted in the chat in terms of like talking about microcosms and um how each time like you participate in one of these sections and you are in this deliberative um, participatory process, like where does the learning happen? And specifically like um, with a black and white perspective, um, is it like a society versus me or do I just hold all my thoughts in my head and I keep them locked in there or do I just put them out and I get checked and I get told, you know, that's not okay to say. Um, and so, yes, that's my question. Okay. Um do you maybe maybe we can like sum this up with um, each of you 
offering a final statement, something you wanted to mention in the end, and also putting out this relationship that you might may see between your talks or assessments and the overarching panel topic. Um, who wants to start? Stephen? Yeah. Um, well, I'd love to have had more time to talk about the other the other talks in the panel, which I thought were really very interesting. And um, I, I do have some thoughts about them. And, and I'd also like to say that if anyone has any questions about what I've been saying, if you send them to my email at the University of Leeds, I'll respond to them. I'll respond to them particularly quickly because I'm trapped in my house and uh, I don't have much else to do. Now, um, in, to this last question about the mind, there's so many things that one could conclude with, but I think, I think it's a spillover effect. I think what you're dealing with with microcosms is whether it's a televised debate or whether it's a deliberative experimental exercise, is you are looking at the spillover into society from that event. So what you are asking is, here is, as it were, the, the process in action, it's meaning in action, to use a, a sociological term. And the question that is happening is that that meaning starts to spill over the edges of the immediate event, and they become signifying forces in a much wider uh, uh, cosmology. And, and for me, that is why televised debates are worthwhile events for all of that awful limitations, as are um, mini publics, as are various elements within the deliberative system. And I think one of the key elements of that spillover, uh, and I've just written a book about this, is everyday political talk. Um, uh, I've, my book incidentally is called um, How People Talk About Politics, and it, it, it's coming out in a couple of months time. But I think that um, what happens is that reception is not simply a process of listening, and we don't believe in the hypodermic needle approach, obviously, but it is a process of entering into some kind of conversation that is um, influenced by the event. And that, for me, is where, uh, and I think your, your question was, was so well phrased, that's where the learning happens. Thank you. Um... Over to either Mark or James. Say Mark. <laughs> um, hey, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I agree with uh, Stephen that uh, there, there are so many more topics that we could be discussing here today. But to conclude, um, and focusing again on, on digital politics, and this is something that maybe I should have emphasized a bit more, is the importance of education. And when I say education, I don't mean exclusively political education, but especially the development of critical thinking skills. Because without these skills, uh, first of all, it is difficult to get a clear picture of the political scene of the moment. Um, it is impossible to use digital tools um, effectively. And it is impossible then to make a change happen, to create an impact. Um, within the society. And I, I saw that very clearly when most of my respondents focused on just making a political change happen. That's what they told me. But their actions also were telling me that we want a social change on, on these day-to-day -day small issues that they do not acknowledge as political actions, but most civil society organizations do consider as political actions and as they know that citizens are a threat of um, engaging in political discussions what they try to do the civil society organizations is to is to teach these um, these civic skills using digital tools precisely because most of the citizens do not acknowledge them as political actions and they are a lot more willing to to participate in 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 these actions um, so yeah that's my uh, that's my final thoughts. Brilliant, thank you so much. Okay, so, so I keep it short. Okay, so <laughs> so for deliberative microcosm, uh, um, for 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 this for this issue, okay, how how can I actually relate deliberative microcosm to 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 self censorship? I think two responses. So the first way we might 
we, we can do is to realize uh, the, the source, as I said, the, uh, of some of the wrongful self-censorship that might be due to the prejudiced social stereotypes. So I think one way that we can use uh, deliberative microbism, mini publics, or deliberation in general, is what, what Mark has said, okay? It's more like educational, okay? So how we can, uh, uh, for example, cultivate epistemic justice, active listening, reflection, and sensitivity to one's own values and discourses. This is one way. The other way is for deliberative Democrats to think about would be how we can make use of deliberative mini publics, uh, like enclave deliberation, to, to, to emancipate or liberate those uh, uh, might be the minority groups, uh, those sufferers of epistemic injustice. But of course, the first question will be uh, how can we actually identify these group of people and then how we are going to encourage them uh, in deliberation? I think these questions are, are not just uh, theoretical, but very, very practical questions. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so I think what became quite clear during your final statements was that you all consider um, technologies when you're addressing them also from this spillover or transmission perspective um, and therefore think they have a role for the broader democratic system. There's this ambivalent assessment of technologies and one particular feature that you were shedding your, the light on now in the concluding statements, I think, was um, how important education for or deliberation about for capacity building um, about technologies and also about how to make use of them um, is in the end. And this is really an incredibly interesting topic, but I think we have to postpone this particular discussion probably to, to another panel and another time. What I want to do now is um, briefly hand over um, to um, Sonia um, because she's gonna um, announce um, something really important and exciting where you can actually win something. Great. So yes, we're launching a picture contest. So this is open uh, to master students, PhD students, early career researchers. So um, your PhD, you should have finished your PhD no later than five years ago. You also have to be a member of the PDD group, of course, and also a registered member of the PSA. So if you want to participate in this contest and you're not a member yet, just get in touch with us uh, to register. So the theme of the competition is reimagining democracy. And uh, we would like you to submit a photograph, an original photograph, or a picture of your own painting, for instance, or another artistic expression, if you like. And uh, um, uh, that can, with, with uh, 200 words, top uh, commentary, to describe how this picture interprets your vision of democracy. So you should submit everything to our um, email address, psademocracy uh, at gmail.com, and we're gonna share more details about the theme of the context and the submission process online on our website, on social media, and also via email. But just to give you some um, um, brief information here, uh, the deadline is the 27th of September, so Sunday, 27th of September, and uh, three winners will be selected and announced by the end of October. Um, they will be selected by a jury, including the four of us conveners of the PDD group and another couple of members that we're currently in the process of recruiting. The winners, um, and there's some hefty prices here actually, so will win uh, £150 in book vouchers each. So um, if you're interested, um, find the artist in you, and we really look forward to your submissions. All, all pictures, all images submitted will be uploaded on our website. So, so this will be also an opportunity to create a nice art gallery space. And the three winners will also be featured in PSA News. So we really look forward to your submissions and more details to come online. I'm done here. Thanks, Danica. Yeah. All right, um, thank you so much to all speakers um, of today's webinar. Um, we're gonna get um, started next week.
um, that addresses um, participatory governance and participatory systems, and that will be chaired by, by Sonia Busso. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing all of you, maybe more back there. And I really enjoyed today's discussion. Thanks to all speakers for their brilliant presentations. And um, if you have any further questions, stay in touch with one of us co-conveners or the speakers. Thanks so much.